everyone. Uh, to all of you here, to all of you who will be watching this later, welcome. This is the American Foreign Policies Conference on Digital Dictators, uh, Media, Authoritarianism, and America's New Challenge. I'm delighted you guys could all come out. Um, my name is Elon Berman. I'm the Senior Vice President of the American Foreign Policy Council. I head up all of our institutional research and analysis, uh, and I spend a lot of time looking at transnational threats. Uh, including in the Middle East, including in Central Asia, and Eurasia, and Asia. And uh, this challenge, the challenge of authorita what we're calling authoritarian media, is, has become one of the most interesting but also the most vexing challenges that everybody's talking about, but nobody's doing anything about. So we thought this would be a really opportune moment to have a public discussion as a sort of soft launch for a project that we are uh, putting out in print later this fall uh, with the same title. So, you know, handy dandy. Uh, you guys will be able to pick it up on Amazon, Barnes and Noble, and er every other reputable bookseller, but with the same title focusing on the same topic. Um, so I'll give a few words uh, of introduction, but let me start uh, first by thanking Senator John Hoven, who was kind enough to sponsor this room. Uh, the office uh, of Senator Hoven works uh, very closely with us on a number of issues uh, that we, we deal with and they've been kind enough to sponsor us on multiple occasions. And let me tell you uh, for just a second about the American Foreign Policy Council, which is uh, one of many, but I think one of the best, maybe I'm biased, but one of the best uh, think tanks uh, operating in, the, uh, in Washington. Uh, our mission set in particular is to bring information to those who make or influence the foreign policy of the United States. And so this is a particularly opportune moment to have a discussion about something that very clearly is affecting the American political sphere, uh, but there's not a lot of answers to be had, at least not yet. Uh, so hopefully we can use this morning's event to start that conversation. And a great place to set the scene, so to speak, is to talk about the election of uh, 2016. Uh, in the wake of what was arguably the most controversial presidential election in American history. And we can quibble, but it was uh, very clear that it was historic. Uh, the United States unexpectedly found itself in a qualitatively new kind of conflict. And as the months have passed, we've uh, discovered, uh, at least since the contours of what that conflict is, uh, we've seen the exposure of a massive Russian campaign of subversion and interference that have, has been aimed at the inner workings of American democracy. And this effort, uh, and let's be clear, uh, by all appearances it is a state effort on the part of the Russian government, ha can be considered a remarkable success. Uh, it has helped to undermine trust among Americans in U.S. political institutions. Uh, it continues to cast a pall over the legitimacy of the new administration in Washington. And it has contributed to discord with, between uh, the Democratic and Republican parties in a way that continues to profoundly roil the American political system. And it's also hardly a thing of the past. Uh, as we meet here today, as we move closer to the fall, it's very clear that the Kremlin is ramping up its disinformation efforts anew in an attempt to affect, to interfere, to otherwise uh, shape the course of the 2018 midterm elections. Um, back in February, Director of National Intelligence Dan Coats warned congressional lawmakers that there should be no doubt that Russia perceives its past efforts to disrupt U.S. elections uh, as a prelude to, uh, both as successful and as a prelude to what it plans to do in the fall because it sees the 2018 midterms, quote, as a potential target for Russian uh, influence operations. This challenge has not faced a coherent response from the United States government, at least not yet. Uh, in his final public address as National Security Advisor, General McMaster uh, told the Atlanta Council in Washington, D.C. that the United States had so far, quote, failed to impose sufficient costs on Russia for its informational assault uh, on democratic societies. Nor have we used this, at least not yet, to muster transatlantic unity. Uh, despite the fact that Russian disinformation is not just about America, it's also about France and Germany and the UK and a host of other nations, uh, we have not seen a unified transatlantic strategy 
designed to build a coherent response between the United States and its allies uh, to this threat. Yet, as significant as, as it is, and this is, I think, a very good place to start, uh, Russia's ongoing disinformation campaign is part of a much larger challenge that now confronts the United States. Recent years have seen the advent of a phenomenon that we have taken to calling authoritarian media. We hope that you'll take to calling it that too, because there's nothing better in Washington than coining a phrase. Uh, but the details, I think, are very clear to everyone. It's the weaponization of news and views, both real and fabricated, by repressive regimes and non-state actors, either via state-controlled outlets or vulnerable media platforms, with a very clear goal, to advance a discrete set of foreign policy and national security objectives that benefit them and work to the detriment of everyone else. And this is a challenging environment, it's a constrained environment, and it's a very fluid environment. And that's why this discussion today, in our opinion, is so important as not the end of a conversation, but the start of a conversation about what can be done, what is being done, and what should be done. And there's really no one better, in my mind, to kick off this conversation than our keynote speaker today. Uh, John Lansing is the Chief Executive Officer and Director of the U.S. Broadcasting Board of Governors, uh, where he, he served in that capacity since September of 2015. Uh, he came to the BBG after nine years of, uh, as President of Scripps Network, where he is credited with guiding the company to becoming a leading developer of unique content across various media platforms, including television, digital, mobile, and publishing. His list of accomplishments are too long to mention. Uh, I've mentioned them in print. They're on your chairs. Uh, but I would just hand this off to John by saying that we're deeply honored that you're going to speak on this today. And uh, thank you in advance for kicking off this conversation. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Oh, come on. Good morning. <laughs> so thank you, Alon. It's a special honor for me to, to join this conference of the American Foreign Policy Council. As you were saying, around the world today, we're seeing an alarming increase in illegitimate and authoritarian regimes expanding their chokehold on press freedom and basic human rights. Citizens in countries from Russia to China to Iran to North Korea have been victimized for decades. But now we're seeing authoritarian regimes expanding repression in places like Cambodia, Turkey, and Venezuela, to name just a few. Add to that the growth of non-state actors like ISIS in the Middle East and Boko Haram in Sub-Saharan Africa. In fact, Freedom House reports that only 13% of the world's population live in a society where the press is entirely free. Think about that for a minute, 13%. So. 87% uh, not living under a free press. And now, with the advent of social media platforms, we're seeing the campaigns of disinformation, lies, and fake news pushed beyond the boundaries of authoritarian regimes to attack Western democracies, as Elon was saying, including American citizens directly. This is a brazen example of what can only be termed information warfare. We're beginning to fully understand attempts by the Kremlin to disrupt and manipulate the 2016 presidential election in the United, in the United States, and their sophisticated and far-reaching efforts to essentially weaponize social media platforms through the use of robots and human trolls. This is un unquestionably intended to weaken the American ideal as a beacon of freedom to the world. It's meant to divide us among ourselves through a distortion of the truth and ultimately undercut the very existence of any verifiable, empirical fact. That's the aim, in my view, of authoritarian disinformation campaigns of today, to destroy the very idea of an objective, agreed-upon set of facts. Think about it from the Kremlin's perspective, for example. In a world where nothing is empirically truthful, any lie will do. And if everything's a lie, then the biggest liar wins. In their world, the death of facts is the first step towards creating the post-truth alternative reality that helps them gain and keep authority with no accountability. That's what we're up against. And it's certainly not just the Kremlin. In Cambodia, the Hun Sen regime is assaulting and jailing journalists for the crime of reporting the truth. In China, citizens of the Uyghur region are being rounded up and placed in, quote, re-education camps, unquote, 
targeting the families of journalists outside of China reporting truthfully about the Chinese government's activities there. And we all saw that in Syria, the Assad regime explains away the murder of innocent women and children from a chemical weapons attack with a barrage of lies under the blanket excuse of fighting terrorists. And in Iran, the recent protest in late December led to the regime blocking the encrypted messaging app Telegram. I'm sure the recent political events in Iran are on the minds of most of you in this room. It's certainly on our minds at the BBG. I'd like to show you an example of our coverage from the Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty, during the wave of protest at the end of December this year. From the beginning of the Iran protests, Iranians turned to their most trusted news sources to gather and share information, Voice of America's Persian service and RFERL's Radio Farda. Together, these networks expanded their operations to provide wall-to-wall -wall coverage of not only the growing unrest and government response, but also U.S. and international reaction. <laughs> Many Iranians took great risks to send user-generated video of the protests directly to the USIM networks and engage in interviews via telephone and social platforms. And while the Iranian authorities were trying to block information, USIM networks were expanding their transmissions to make sure the truth was heard. It's getting through. Given the dynamic situation, it's more important than ever that Iranians get the facts about U.S. positions on key issues, responsible and informed analysis of those issues, and a truthful dialogue about what's happening inside Iran and from within the United States. Our media outlets in Iran, VOA and RFERL, are committed to bringing unbiased, accurate, and comprehensive news and information to the Persian speakers of Iran. And the BBG is actively looking for ways to sharpen the impact of VOA Persian and RFERL's Radio Farda. Last year, I commissioned an independent study to take a fresh look at our Persian broadcasting across all radio, television, and digital platforms in Iran. I'd like to thank the AFPC, and especially Ilan Berman, who chaired our uh, study group and provided us with a roadmap for taking our work in both Radio Farda and, our, and uh, VOA Persian to the next level. We're taking the recommendations seriously, and we're acting on them. In terms of our impact in Iran, our most recent research in the country indicates that BOA and RFERL combined reach 23% of Iranian adults in the country, nearly 14 million people, on a weekly basis across all platforms. Our skyrocketing audience in Iran is aided by the BBG's Internet Freedom Tools, which allow citizens there to circumvent in Iranian government censorship to communicate with one another safely. At the height of the protest, BBG-sponsored circumvention technology averaged 800,000 users per day and ranked in the top three downloads among all apps during the protests. Earlier this month, when President Trump announced the U.S. withdrawal from the Iran deal, VOA reached Persian speakers in Iran and around the globe with a live special on satellite TV channels and was simulcast on four digital platforms. 
On social media, the videos of the President's remarks were viewed more than two million times. This included simultaneous translation of Persian in the announcement and live reactions from diaspora representatives from Los Angeles to Paris. Audiences around the globe could also tune into VOA's new show with Greta Van Sustern, Unplugged, to see her interview one-on-one -on -one with National Security Advisor John Bolton. Our reach and impact in Iran show that Persian speakers place a premium on U.S. international media content. They see it as a key source of objective news during moments of uncertainty, as well as in their everyday lives. Now, carrying that success forward, we're very excited about a new project in the pipeline, a 24-7 Persian language global network. It's a cooperative effort of the Voice of America and Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty. We plan to launch the new global network in the first quarter of 2019. The 24-7 network will build on the BBG's existing strong Persian language brands, and our goal is to reach Persian speakers in Iran and around the globe. The network will be distributed in Iran, wherever large Persian diaspora audiences can be found from Paris to Dubai and beyond. The idea is to reach the diaspora around the globe and let the diaspora communicate back into Iran as well as reaching Iran directly. Now, looking beyond Iran, the five networks of the BBG, VOA, RFB, Radio and TV, Marti, the, office, the Middle East Broadcasting Networks and Radio Free Asia continue to expose corruption through investigative reporting, share life-saving health knowledge, and provide information needed for vibrant civic debate. Their reporting spotlights problems that in turn trigger corrective action by governments. This is a core tenet for us. Honest and truthful journalism acts as a catalyst for positive change, and it represents our best weapon on the information battlefield. The BBG continues to provide accurate and compelling journalism that reflects the values of our society, freedom, democracy, and hope. As the BBG CEO, I'm passionate and committed to ensuring that the global work we do delivers on our mission to the U.S. government and to the American people. One of the ways we do that is our market-driven shift to digital and social media distribution. Digital is the fastest growing element of the BBG's global audience. Survey research measures our current digital audience at 45 million and growing at 40%, more than 40% since 2015. We're making these shifts because we operate in a constantly evolving media space. The global spread of information has changed profoundly since the BBG's creation. Global communities are awash in information and not all of it, or much of it, is truthful. Groups and governments use modern tools not to win the news cycle, per se, but to shape the very choices of information that's available to citizens within their grasp. And modern authoritarianism is adept at disguising their tools of repression. I believe the best response to all of this is basic, objective, fact-based reporting that arms citizens with the truth. And that's what our networks do best. Our core role is to support free, open, and democratic societies. These societies are important to us as a country because they enjoy greater stability and prosperity. They live in peace with their neighbors. They reject terrorism and extremism, and they make better political allies and trading partners. Yet governments around the world are increasingly cracking down on the free flow of information, silencing dialogue and dissent, and distorting reality. State-sponsored broadcasters, whether CCTV's new multi-million, hundreds of million dollar investment in China today, or Russia today, are expanding their global operations, opening news bureaus, and developing programming that in ways <coughs> subtle and not so subtle distort the truth or completely fabricate facts to disrupt and manipulate vulnerable societies. Of the 10 worst offenders, which include Cuba, Iran, North Korea, and Syria, the BBG has one or more than one network in each of those countries. And to address all these challenges, the BBG is becoming more agile in program delivery, following our audiences wherever they will most likely consume media. We're also identifying key audience targets, particularly young future leaders. We're holding ourselves accountable for how we impact our audience, not just reach an audience. We're targeting strategic partnerships on innovation and next-generation media platform development. 
And we're combining the strengths of our network, strategically cooperating to create new products and building a force multiplier as a result. The most recent e example of strategic cooperation is last year's launch of Current Time, a Russian language 24-7 global network. The name Current Time roughly translated in Russian means the real story. It's widely available across Central Asia, the Balkans, the Baltics, and even within the Russian Federation by satellite. It's also available in large capital cities around the world with large Russian diasporas, such as Jerusalem or Madrid. Here's a short video clip in English that explains this 24-7 Russian language network called Current Time. Я нахожусь в столице Афганистана, Кабуле. Это российская крепость, российская сторона. Будем готовить блюдо популярное для острова Корфу. Вот высоковольтная линия, вот справа от меня действительно всего царя. Росгвардия и ОМОД. Вместо телевидения – интернет. That just smells fish, doesn't it? Right. It's not true. It's fake news. Смотри, Боба, программа новостях и тех, кто их делает. На фейках и сенсациях. Совет России НАТО задерживают жестко, как я уже говорил. Тед Круз накануне. Сегодня утром полиция в Гамбурге окончательно взяла ситуацию под свой контроль. Он, видимо, дали приказ выступать. Канал на русском языке. Настоящее время. Телеканал Настоящее время. Настоящее время. Despite near total exclusion from the Russian cable market, we do have access, as I said, via satellite. Current time is doing incredibly well and continues to expand uh, rapidly. Over the last year, Current Time had more than 400 million online video views on social media platforms. Its audience on Vkontakte, the most popular social network among mainstream Russians, has quadrupled in size in the last year. Another weapon of our high-impact strategic approach to pushing back against Russian propaganda is Polygraph.info. Polygraph.info is an English language fact-checking website which serves as a resource for verifying the increasing volume of Russian lies and disinformation being distributed and shared globally. Polygraph's Russian language sister project is called Factograph, also designed for fact-checking, but again this one in Russian. Factograph compares statements by politicians or officials with real facts, providing clarity and a sense of how Russia's experience matches up with the rest of the world. Both are joint ventures of RFERL and Voice of America, and they highlight Kremlin-backed disinformation that provide factual alternatives for Russian speakers and English speakers. Turning briefly to the Middle East, our pan-Arab network Al Hura is rapidly expanding its news programming by adding an additional six hours of live news per day and opening up a 24-7 news bureau in Dubai. Under the new leadership of Alberto Fernandez, leading voices in the Middle East are now being heard as they de debate the daily fluctuations of policy, and the credibility of Al Hura is on the rise as it moves people, modernizes equipment, and creates an energetic new pulse to the front lines of the information battlefield in the Middle East. It's confronting ISIS directly with special documentary programming like Exiting ISIS, which profiles disillusioned former ISIS fighters who defected from the terrorist camps. From the ravages of Syria to the former Soviet sphere, the Korean, the Korean Peninsula, and the rapidly expanding influence of Chinese media, the export of US journalism and the values of free media and free speech speak to the world at this critical juncture. Independent journalism brings clear, unfiltered news to the people who need it. We want people to make informed decisions, and we believe when given the chance, 
This method definitely plays a major role in demystifying Russian, Chinese, or ISIS narratives. Like defense, development, and diplomacy, U.S. international media, accurate, balanced, and true is an essential part of our standing on the world stage. We know that positioning our global media networks to be an impactful tool of U.S. foreign policy on the dynamic 21st century battlefield for information isn't just a good media strategy. It's also fundamental to achieving our mission of informing, engaging, and connecting people around the world in support of freedom and democracy. Despite our efforts, media repression will continue to be a daunting task for all of us. But at the end of the day, however, we're confronting information warfare and authoritarian media toe-to-toe -to -toe with fact-based, truthful, professional journalism. Some, even here in Congress, argue that America should fight fire with fire, develop our own propaganda machine. <coughs> I would argue, I'd love to hear all of your thoughts, but I would argue that anything that takes us away from truthful, accountable, and honest reporting about America and about the world would really serve only to play right into the hands of those who really want to destroy the very idea of empirical fact. I'll close with a familiar quote, but one that I like to use often from Edward R. Murrow, who served as director of U.S. Information Agency, the predecessor to the BBG. He testified before Congress in 1963, and to this point, he said, to be persuasive around the world, we must be believable. And to be believable, we must be credible. And to be credible, we must be truthful. His words are as resoundingly true today as they ever were. So thank you, and Ilan, I'd be happy to take any questions. John, thank you so much. That that was uh, really masterful, and it uh, actually uh, uh, we previewed this when we started. We were talking about Murrow uh, before you spoke, yeah. but um, let me do this uh, in, in keeping with your schedule and in keeping with the conference. Let, let, let me see if there's just a couple of questions uh, for Director Lansing, uh, and uh, after that we'll transition into our first panel. Uh, any questions? Sir, in the back. Um, is there any uh, effort, kind of a, a cross government, to coordinate the, the works of your organization with defense, diplomacy, and other aspects of American policy? We're we're actually. Did we hear the question? All right. It, yeah, we're, we're actually uh, doing more and more of that ourselves, uh, and reaching out to the GEC, reaching out to DOD, reaching out to think tanks. Um, and trying to coordinate and help us think about how we can become more impactful. We're also reaching out to what's called the DG7. Those are the other uh, Western democratic media organizations that are government supported, such as the Javela or the BBC, um, as well to coordinate and think about fighting this threat on a, on a global stage. It's not formal as yet, but uh, we're open and, uh, and happy to be uh, touching base with any part of the, of the interagency. Wonderful. Uh, one more. Right there. What kind of reception are you getting out of DOD? Actually quite good. We, we have a really good relationship with DOD. I was just attended their uh, Russian Information Group meeting last week and uh, while classified it was clear to me that they were um, really thinking about it the right way. They respect our lane, if you will. Our lane is one that we have an independent uh, you know, ability to make editorial decisions and they don't seek to involve themselves in that. But they have been helpful in, in funding some of our efforts, knowing that the independence of the editorial decision making remains with us. Uh, join me in, in thanking Director Lansing.